Well, thank you, Roxana. Um, well, first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I agree with Roxana. It's going to be very difficult to uh, give a discussion after Dr. Sharma's uh, great overview of uh, where we've been and where we're going. And um, I'm also surrounded by <coughs> luminaries, really, in surgery and interventional cardiology. And so uh, it's a difficult task to talk about where we're going and where we've been. And uh, no relations to disclose, other than the fact that it's discomforting to have to talk about this in such a uh, short period of time. And instead of going back and looking at Strides May, let's talk about the future. Um, and let's focus for me, as a uh, non-interventional cardiologist, uh, what's, for, for example, if we focus on the aortic valve, which will be what I'm really going to discuss uh, with you, is what's going on with this valve? Um, this is not passive wear and tear. Uh, we know that there are cardiovascular risk factors that predispose to aortic stenosis. It's a proliferative, inflammatory, progressive lesion. Um, good data showing that indeed it's inflammatory comes from uh, Mark Dweck using uh, PET CT um, uh, to illuminate where is ossification occurring with sodium fluoride and where is inflammation occurring with fluorodeoxyglucose. Uh, there's a correlation here, um, not only in a cross sectional analysis, but also in a, in a longitudinal analysis. Uh, here's two patients in a follow up s study from uh, that group. Uh, showing early um, uh, uh, inflammation where there's very little calcification, but several months later, those areas of inflammation have now calcified. So it's clearly progressive, related to lots of factors, uh, inflammation being one of those. And further information regarding the inflammatory process in the aortic valve comes from this uh, immunohistochem immunohistochemistry study by Mahmoud and co-workers in, in explanted aortic valves removed at the time of surgery. Uh, showing uh, upregulation of uh, uh, lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2, which is an enzyme which cleaves uh, phospholipids um, into fatty acids and phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylcholine being a very uh, important inflammatory modifier. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> as you know, we have genetic data uh, from Thanosoulis and co-workers uh, in a huge GWAS study of roughly 50,000 individuals with uh, validation across, the, uh, across uh, the world, demonstrating a single SNP sitting on chromosome 6 um, that's uh, highly associated with aortic valve calcification. Um, this is in the locus of LPA, the uh, uh, gene that codes for circulating levels of LP little a. So little LP little a has become kind of a, a target <clears throat> and has been verified in a number of large studies, both from the Kaiser organization and these data from uh, Denmark, where we have good population data. Uh, as you can see, large numbers of, uh, of patients who are uh, in a registry looking for the development of aortic valve calcification over the course of time. Um, and one sees that um, <clears throat> as one looks at the levels of LP little a, when you have a uh, level in the 90th percentile or greater, there, there's a signal of an increased hazard ratio for development of aortic stenosis. And in those individuals on the left, where they all had genetic data, uh, over 50% of those individuals mm -hmm. who ultimately develop aortic stenosis with those high levels of LP little a are carrying that gene as well. So there's a, uh, a, a signal here that there may be a genetic predisposition, but there's also a signal that LPA little a might be a target. So the uh, schematic for this, which comes from Philippe Pibro's work, is that LPA little a gets into the intracellular space, gets hydrolyzed by that phospholipase A2, a uh, creating a lysophosphatidylcholine, which uh, along with the oxidized phospholipids in LP little a is creating a huge inflammatory matrix for recruitment of macrophages, uh, turning uh, interstitial valve cells to become a, a, a more of a phenotypic representation of osteoblasts and leading to mineralization. So the importance of this is that there's got to be some druggable targets here. You know, maybe we can begin to talk about slowing down this process. Um, maybe not preventing it, but at least slowing it down so that uh, one could uh, perhaps have a better outcome for patients uh, once they do need intervention, or perhaps prolong the time where intervention is going to be required. Uh, so what are the drugs that might be, re might be considered here? Statins, we know, have not slowed down the uh, uh, progression of aortic stenosis. Uh, 
um, then again, statins have very little effect on LP little a, whereas PCSK9 inhibitors do. And so uh, there's one paper I found in the uh, endocrinology literature, which I suspect many of you have not uh, seen because we don't go to this journal often, uh, where there's a loss of function mutation in PCSK9, meaning individuals who have very low levels of uh, PCSK9. And those individuals have a significantly lower risk of developing uh, aortic stenosis, uh, uh, even when you adjust for levels of uh, L LDL cholesterol or LP little a, suggesting that if we had a drug that could uh, inhibit PCSK9, perhaps we could also slow down progression of aortic stenosis. And so there's a sub-study from Fourier uh, by Bergmark and co-workers, which actually addressed the uh, issue of whether one could uh, inhibit PCSK9 and perhaps have a better outcome in terms of the development of aortic stenosis and need for aortic valve replacement. So first, they, they replicated uh, data that we've already discussed that individuals who have aortic stenosis events, progression of aortic stenosis, or develop uh, indications for aortic valve replacement or individuals with higher levels of uh, LP little a. That's been shown before. Um, but they then looked at the results of evolucumab in these individuals and demonstrated uh, at least a signal for a reduced rate of aortic stenosis events and need for aortic valve replacement. It's just a signal. It's a, a sub-study. It's underpowered to actually uh, uh, make strong statements. They, they indicated quite appropriately that this is a uh, hypothesis generating kind of study, but it creates the information that perhaps there's a uh, uh, one mechanism here where one could perhaps slow down the disease process. Um, and PCSK9 lowers LP little a, but not a lot. Uh, but now we have other data with new drugs, uh, such as this uh, paper just published by the uh, Ocean investigators. Uh, uh, recently in the England Journal of Medicine presented at the American Heart Association showing that opacerin, which is a small interfering RNA, really decreases LP little a to levels we've uh, uh, never seen before in, eleva in individuals who have uh, elevated LP little a. And so this would be an interesting drug to test in patients uh, either developing aortic stenosis or at risk for it. This is a, obviously uh, too simplistic an approach. There can't be one um, uh, drug only, and there can't be only one mechanism by which aortic valves calcify. This uh, uh, rendition, I would think, of the New York subway by uh, Brian Lindman uh, points out the, all of the intricate, interrelated things that can go on, not just on the left where we've been talking about lipid infiltration, but also the, then the progression toward infl inflammatory markers and the fibrocalcific response. But for the younger people who are here, uh, there's going to be a future for you, perhaps, in identifying drugs that work along many of these multiple pathways that could indeed slow down the process. Uh, not that we're going to take a business away from our surgeons and our interventional cardiologists, but perhaps leading to uh, a longer period of time before there is uh, the need for uh, intervention, but also perhaps a way to protect the ventricle as well, because that's, I think, the next step. It's not just what's going on with the valve, but what's going on with the ventricle. Paul Wood put this very well in over uh, 60 years ago in his seminal paper that uh, those of you in my generation probably were aware of in medical school. Uh, it's 1958, and it's, it's typical Woodsian uh, uh, verbiage here. Aortic stenosis is a simple mechanical fault which, if severe enough, imposes a heavy burden on the left ventricle and sooner or later overcomes it. Can't say it any better than that. And so what's going on is there's left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, it's a marker, it's a protective mechanism. Uh, and it's a marker of severity of the pressure overload. It's a mechanism to reduce the wall stress in the setting of pressure overload. Uh, that's a good short-term fix. But like most compensatory mechanisms for myocardial overload, LVH has short-term benefits but long-term adverse consequences. It will lead to myocardial stiffness, increased LV and diastolic and LA pressures, kind of a HEFPEF phenotype, uh, a contributor perhaps to adverse outcomes. Um, and we can study this now. Unlike the early studies in the uh, 80s by Kreinbuhl and uh, 
um, Marco Torino, where they were, they were doing biopsies to look for interstitial connective tissue, we can now measure that with MRI. And good data showing that mid-wall fibrosis is an independent mar marker of mortality in patients with aortic stenosis. Again, this comes from Mark Dweck's work. But I thought the uh, subsequent papers from that group were very informative. Here's a study by Chin and co-workers in a series of patients. With, they were all symptomatic. We haven't shown what's going to happen with asymptomatic patients yet. But they're only go undergoing MRI studies. And there's three subgroups, those who have normal myocardium, those who have uh, evidence of extracellular expansion with T1, T2 mapping, and those who have frank uh, replacement fibrosis with uh, late gadolinium enhancement. And uh, what they demonstrated in these three groups, as you might expect, is that the patients uh, going from left to right have more severe aortic stenosis. Uh, they have more left ventricular hypertrophy. Their mass is increased. They therefore have greater LV diastolic dysfunction. And what was most interesting for me is, in addition to all of that, they're leaking troponin. And so there's a troponin leak here as well, which suggests perhaps that that's why they are developing fibrosis, because there's actually myocardial damage. And so maybe putting this together as to what the consequences of LBH would be, would be that it obviously creates diastolic dysfunction, but it also re results ultimately in interstitial and replacement myocardial fibrosis, which creates more diastolic dysfunction. And perhaps there's also microvascular damage or disease, which can lead to myocardial ischemia, which then contributes to both of the above topics. So LVH perhaps could be a target also. Uh, not, not so much to prevent the um, beneficial effects of reducing wall stress, but perhaps ways to diminish the amount of interstitial content that goes along with that. And perhaps that could lead to a better outcome. So really nice viewpoint, very quick uh, two-pager, which is worth reading, from Brian Lindman and Joanne Lindenfeld uh, uh, has been published, suggesting that we need to be talking about targeting the ventricle to prevent deterioration of structure and function. So the candidate therapies right off the top would be those that are kind of GDMT for heart failure. Um, none of these have been tried yet. We do have some, some population data, perhaps, that ACE inhibitors actually are beneficial. But it's, it's a longitudinal, I'm sorry, it's a, a retrospective uh, cohort kind of data. But, you know, drugs like uh, spironolactone, a, a mineralocorticoid a receptor antagonist, might be, might be very effective, at perhaps, at reducing the amount of uh, fibrosis worth trying, uh, but perhaps there's others too that could come along in the pipeline to reduce some of these effects. And so the schema that Lindman and Lindefeld came up with is, is uh, kind of makes sense if you think about it. Aortic stenosis progresses, leads to hypertrophy, and ultimately to fibrosis, which is maladaptive remodeling, uh, worsening of left ventricular function. Uh, that we go from asymptomatic to symptomatic. Um, and ultimately, these maladaptive processes of remodeling dysfunction could lead to residual risk that even when we intervene, we may be intervening too late. Uh, so, you know, are the medical therapies to target for the valve that we've discussed? Uh, LP little a is the target du jour. There'll probably be others. Uh, medical therapies to target the left ventricle as well to slow down these maladaptive processes allow for the beneficial properties, but not the maladaptive ones. Uh, and then, perhaps, once we get a, a little more uh, evidence, uh, earlier intervention, so that we're not sending our patients too late for intervention. Uh, get earlier, earlier intervention, perhaps before symptoms, uh, before AS is severe, uh, uh, trying to define when the appropriate timing may be. Um, and then, hopefully, there'll be regression and recovery after aortic valve replacement, which we already see in our patients when we time it right. But we also see that this is not always complete. It could be partial or incomplete. And we're left with uh, some baggage. We do know from those early biopsy studies that I mentioned from Crian Buell, Otto uh, Hess, and uh, Marco Torina in the 1980s, that when you replace the valve and, the, and you have regression of hypertrophy, the myocytes regress but the interstitial connective tissue remains. And so you, you, you have a persistent stiffer ventricle, which can then can lead to either uh, uh, heart failure over the long haul, or perhaps even arrhythmias. Uh, 
So a medical therapy could be helpful here too, after we intervene, to show whether we can further effectively, uh, uh, positively reverse remodel the ventricle as well. And so that's a, a quick snippet. I had to be really focused here because I only had 15 minutes and I thought I would at least focus on something that I, I think we have some uh, information that is at our fingertips, but we need more data. And I think in the future we'll see that perhaps there's a way of uh, reducing the rate of progression, targets to treat the valve and also to treat the ventricle and perhaps lead to uh, better patient outcomes. Thank you very much. <laughs>